Thank you for being here. I acknowledge that the city of Hamilton, where I record this podcast, is situated upon the traditional First Nations territories of the Erie, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, Mississaugas, and the Chonodon of the so-called neutral tribes. Hamilton is also directly adjacent to the Haldeman Treaty Territory. Welcome to the arena, where sometimes the hardest part is showing up. My name is Linda McLaughlin. Thank you for being here. Ernie Lutit is the kind of gentle soul you might underestimate when you first meet him. It's one of the many qualities that made him such a great leader, a tenacious police officer, and as young constables have described him, a trailblazer. But to him, he's just being Ernie. Thank you for listening to this special Remembrance Day episode of The Arena. This is episode 43. We've had some fun, haven't we? <laughs> yes. Yeah. The best meat plants never survive initial contact. That's right. <laughs> okay, so we seem to be doing okay here. Ernie, I am so delighted we're able to do this, and we had a bit of a, a challenge the first time we tried this out, but but here we are today. <laughs> try to get <laughs> this conversation in. And uh, it, it's really an honor to talk to you as you are both a retired member of the police force, but also a uh, retired member of the military. And so thank you on both fronts for your service. Thank you. You certainly went above and beyond the call of duty many times in your career. You've written three books uh, that I have next to me here, most especially about your time working in the Saskatoon police force. So I guess we'll dive in. I normally have an intro for people and, and my philosophy is very much jump in if I've said something that's incorrect or overblown your your accomplishments or something like that. Okay. Ernie Lutet, you're a son, brother, father, and soon a Mosham, or grandfather. You're a Messonie Cree from Northern Ontario. You grew up in a town called Oba, which is about a thousand kilometers or a 12 and a half hour drive north of Toronto. While it is a place where you go to heal now, as a child, it was a rough start. You dropped out of school and started working on the railroad at age 15. And in 1978, at 17, you joined the military, where you stayed for nine years. Is that correct? Eight. Eight years. Eight years. While you served, you went to Cyprus with the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry, or PPCLI. Later in your career, you became a member of the military police, stationed in Wainwright, Alberta, at the PPCLI Battle School the largest training center in Western Canada. You were honorably discharged in 1987, and shortly thereafter you joined the Saskatoon Police, where you served as a patrol officer and then patrol sergeant for 30 years. It's kind of a neat and tidy way to summarize your career, but <laughs> you were known on the streets of Saskatoon as Indian Ernie, affectionately by those you served, and not so affectionately by the people you regularly arrested. Since your retirement, you've written three books about your experiences and the lessons they taught you. Colleagues, civilians, and criminals alike have picked up your books, curious to see if their own stories might appear. Having read those books, there are a number of stories that stood out to me, including your efforts to interfere with a source of Lysol and cooking wine sold to the desperately addicted, your testimony in the Stone Child Inquiry and the Starlight Tours which involved at least two members of the Saskatoon police driving First Nations people to the outskirts of Saskatoon and leaving them stranded in freezing temperatures. Three men died, including 17-year-old Neil Stonechild. You proudly served in patrol for your whole career, believing you could do your best work boots on the ground, in your community, instead of from behind a desk. When you retired in 2013, you carried with you thousands of stories experiences, and mental images, many of which you have not been able to shake. Writing and speaking about those experiences have helped, as well as a strong and supportive family. I really appreciate you speaking with me today. 
welcome to the arena, Ernie. Happy to be here. Thank you. You're welcome. I think what really struck me about reading your books was how concise you were in being able to share your stories. They weren't written in a gratuitous way. They were written in a very sort of factual way, very police-like in terms of (laughs) stick to the facts, but you wrote in a very humanistic way as well. You really brought the impact of what living in those neighborhoods, what patrolling certain neighborhoods in Saskatoon, uh, the impact it had on you, but what it was like. And as a civilian who lives thousands of kilometers away from Saskatoon, I really got a sense of what that time was like, how it impacted you and how it impacted the people who lived in that community. And I believe the impact that you had as a patrolman in that community. So that was a long-winded way of saying I really admire what you've accomplished, both as a person who's dedicated their life to serving and now as a writer. It's it's pretty impressive. <laughs> Thank you. Um, when I was doing all that, and I thought that's what everybody was doing. You know what I mean? And uh, as it went on, it became very addictive because hmm. patrol is an exciting place and you meet so many people and, and it just became addicted to that. I guess lifestyle, if you want to call it that. And, and every time you had success, it was, it was everybody's success. That's the way it felt. If someone was sniffing solvents and actually stopped and actually got to like afterwards and you were paying, you had a part in that, it was a sense of accomplishment and it didn't seem while I was doing it, like it was a big deal. To be honest, uh, I was just kind of a loner when it came to work. I had some really good patrol partners that were like-minded people, but of course, they went on the normal paths that uh, you do when you're a police officer, or going to detectives or moving on to different uh, uh, branches of police service. It just felt like that was where I belong. You can make a difference. As the experience accumulated over the years, and a lot of the stories that I wrote to teach young constables to be empathetic, to don't be in such a hurry to get to drug section, or don't be in such a hurry to get out of the places you're working because you get more and richer experiences by dealing with the people that you're supposed to deal with for longer terms. Because a lot of guys would work a district for two years and then go try another district or work a district like the ones I were. And then after a couple of years, seeing that the difference you could make over the long term if you stuck and patrolled. And, uh, and then after a couple of years, uh, head over to the quiet side of town and then work the way through the detective stuff like that. But I, I tried to, to teach them that they were missing things. They were missing one place for as long as you could until people knew you and you knew the people. And I think that made a significant difference in the way I felt about police because those people were part of my life as well. Well, the guy you would arrest every two weeks and he knew who you were and you knew who he was and you knew his addictions. You could suggest what, how he could get help, but you knew he wouldn't take it. He had a little expression every time they arrested him, he, his first thing is he chalk it up, right? chalk it up, right? <laughs> and so he almost went forward to deal with him because he knew he was going to be funny. Sometimes he'd be angry when he was, if he was hung over and he got picked up and he'd have to deal with sobriety for a little while until he dealt with his warrants or whatever. But most of the time he was uh, just a funny guy. Right? <laughs> and there were so many people like that over the years in, in Saskatoon. And then getting their backstories was a huge part too. But once you get past that initial hostility when an arrest takes place, you're booking them in and get talking to them. Where are you from? And you know, so I'm from way up north. And you know, how'd you get here? And they tell their story. And, and the way you viewed people changed, including people that weren't criminals, that you just saw people that, that hung out or stuck in, in certain neighborhoods, like a furniture store for 40 years in a family in a rough part of town that had to put up with some discarded needles in their back alley or people that would drink or pass out at their back alley. Just how everybody understood each other. Mm-hmm. And some people complained bitterly and other people were just, you know, already, could you drop by on Friday? Cause they're going to be drinking in the back of my business and I'm trying to deliver furniture or whatever. So you embraced the moniker Indian Ernie when you were on the streets, that was your, or you accepted it, maybe whether you embraced it or not, I'm not sure, but. Yeah. Cause it was identifiable and, uh, uh it started from the kids. Right. And the neighborhoods I worked at, and, and I just did things differently. I'm, if I didn't have a call, I'd get in my car and walk around. 
and yeah. walk around, not where the businesses were, but like just in neighborhoods in general and the places where you very rarely saw the police unless there was a call. And uh, there's always uh, one brave kid in every neighborhood that, uh, that's going to see what you're doing and they'd come follow you. And uh, as soon as you turn around, phew, they were gone, rage took off. Next time you come back, there's a brave kid, a couple of his buttons. And uh, eventually they worked up the courage to ask what I was doing there. Why are you here? And I said, my work here. What are you doing? It's walking around. <laughs> hey. And then <laughs> the, one would, the one would say, what's your name? And I said, sir. Okay. And then, are you an Indian? And these were young First Nations kids. I said, yeah. So after that, every time I showed up, I would say it's Indian Army. And then eventually people added things to Indian Army, depending on the side of the law you're on. Uh, but uh, long and short of it is it, I became an identifiable part of the community, whether you like me or not. And yeah. that's right pe- up to the end of my career. Like a good example of how we did impact it in a community was, and I didn't know they were doing this, but the bad guys that were wanted or the bad girls or, would call communications to see if I was working. They say, is Indian really working? Oh, not, no, he'll be out tomorrow. So they go get smokes or white drugs or whatever, get a do or try to. And so I started changing my hours around. And this one girl I've been looking for, she had eat frog horns. And she did, she had called comms that morning. I didn't know that. And I hadn't booked on onto the computer because I, I didn't want to go to any meetings. So, so I, I booked on once again on the street and there I see her walking. So I jump up. They said, ah, gotcha. He said, you got all these words. Said, That's not fair. And he, I called to make sure you, you weren't working. And they told me you were fucked <laughs> on. So yeah, you can, you could have a little bit of impact even in the city of 300,000. So that's amazing. That's awesome. And I've had every name you can have to have Indian, indigenous, Aboriginal, first nations. Yeah. I don't care what you call me. So like, you know, a lot of your, yeah, be nice about it. But in, besides that, but, but in the 2000s, indigenous aren't even going to sound it. That way. Uh, wasn't a very good title. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot to sort of yell across the street or something like that. <laughs> yeah. 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 Meeting you. And trying to imagine you as the action figure, Ernie, I have a hard time sort of computing. I, I have no doubt it's in you, but you were uh, pretty rough and ready. And you had to be just in the yeah. uh, work in the streets. What was dinner conversation like in your household? Well, uh, our family was pretty close. My formative years would be in Northern Ontario. And we, we lived in a small two house. There's uh, four kids, my mom, and uh, who's now my stepdad. Been with my mom for 50 years. Uh, and then and my uncle who slept on a couch in the living room and uh, uh, cool oil lamps and uh, wood stove. And we had a small oil stove, but it was only used at night, but he didn't have it going all day. We were really close. The kitchen was the, the social center, like a lot of farm. And uh, my mom was an avid reader. So a lot of our conversations were around books. We only could get uh, CBC North on the radio, one of those little radios with uh, Go hang your friend antenna that ran on batteries and seemed to last forever. Yeah. Barbara from, and as it happens, and all that stuff worked usually what prompted conversations in the, in the house. And so it's just a, a good uh, time. It was like, we're by any means rich or well to do or anything like that. So it was that day to day struggle that went on, but it always gave you that purpose, like home water, because uh, we didn't have running water. There was a well behind our place, but it was uh, wasn't drinkable. So we used to haul the water in buckets from the railway station, chop the wood, uh, snaring rabbits uh, to supplements, the food sources, fishing. It was a fair hike to our school. Our school was pretty unique because it was a one-room school. There was an apartment in the back for the teachers. But what would normally happen with the teachers is they would be teachers that uh, had been blackballed in the cell. Either it'd been for drinking or for, and this was the last resort for them. And the first couple of teachers I had there were the one in particular he used to actually drink while he was teaching. He, 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 he used to have one screw in a wine bottle and he'd say, Mr. Larkin's just going to have some more tea. But we all knew because everybody knew what drink at the time or lots of people drank. Uh, and as the day went on, he'd start slurring and he was a, and he, a specific character. He uh, kept a shirt button read to the, uh, the very top button and always wore long sleeves. He had two sons living with him 
in his little apartment. There were students there as well. But he was the one that told me probably grade three, grade four, that I had better learn to do something with my hands because I wasn't even up to anything. Oh, my God. <laughs> And, and after he left, we got a guy from the South that was just dynamic, just a dynamic guy. And he was uh, very worldly and, and, and stuff. And, and I think what happened, this is back in the 60s now, is uh, he was gay. And back then, he got, you couldn't openly be gay, I guess, in, in some Ontario school system. So he came out to teach in Oba, and he was just uh, an amazing man. He actually bought it was money in the first VCR when he came out for and showed us like the moon landing and, and uh, clips from the news and stuff like that, because none of us had TVs. And uh, I'd really emphasize on the reading and stuff, and he was, but he drank lots too. <laughs> and uh, eventually, my last teacher broke the mold because she was the top candidate of her teaching class. And mm. that was coming up to teach us pretty much undisciplined kids. <laughs> and I was always two years younger than most kids that were in school. And so it was the odd man out. And I used to get beat up a lot because it was short, heavy, and, uh, and mouthy, I guess. <laughs> and that, those don't really work out. <laughs> <laughs> and just a lot of the foundations of my character came from now. My mother and her love of reading, the teachers I had, except for the, the drunk guy, that made me learn to love reading as well. We didn't have a library. We had a couple of shelves with books on them, but there is an encyclopedia uh, Britannica there. And then all the books that the big school systems didn't want or that were outdated, they just shipped all of us. And there was one, I think it was a 1950 or 60s textbook, but it was the history of Canada. And of course, being First Nations, I was always looking for references to us and uh, not finding very many short of the short of the history they taught back then, the mm -hmm. brush over residential schools and all that stuff like that. It was very isolated, but it was very formative for me because that's where, I, like you said, I, I love that sense of community. And at least you knew everybody, <laughs> even mm -hmm. if it wasn't good, at least you knew everybody. And that love of nature, love of reading, which is, to me, is one of the most important skills you can have as a person, especially in our country. And there was a very amount of violence, but it just seemed the way life was, I guess. Uh, some of my friends, I knew that their uh, fathers beat the mothers and beat them sometimes. And you tried to be there for them, but of course you're just kids, so you can't really do anything. What did you tell your mom? And there was two hotels and sometimes our entertainment was to hang around the front of the bars at, on Friday nights and see you got the fights, right? So it, violence, I didn't like it, but it seemed to be just loads everywhere. And there was one particular kid, his mother used to get beat so bad. And uh, we'd come and tell them in it, they would straighten it out. We weren't going to stick around for that part. We had to go away for high school to Hearst. And uh, we'd used to take that train uh, on uh, Sunday and we'd come back on Saturday. And uh, when I first got to, to Hearst, they put me up in boarding houses. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the Board of Education paid for it. And I think my mom had to pay a little bit as well. But anybody that's ever been billeted, I guess, the sports guys could probably relate to this. A lot of times you're not part of the house you stay in. And some people are do, just doing it for money. And a lot of kids that are foster care could probably relate to that really well. Uh, those that are, were in the foster system. And you never felt really, truly welcome. And then the same in high school, because it was uh, predominantly French high school. And uh, we were kids from the bush, right? The older kids. And they weren't style. We didn't fit in. Uh, I think disco was the big thing back then. Right. And, and so you had fights in high school. And you had bad experiences in boarding homes. And, but I, for the positive things, I, have, I did have some really good friends at Hearst. I had an English teacher, Mr. Mullen, the old Ontario system. He used to go to grade 13 at, when I was in high school. I loved English so much with him that I took grade nine English in the first semester, grade 10 in the second semester. And then saying I did 10 and 11 in grade 10. And then uh, half what she did uh, before I quit school, I, I could do grade 12 English all because he was such a dynamic teacher. But, but the rest of the high school just wasn't working out. <laughs> so yeah, I ended up quitting and uh, went to work on a tie meeting, it was called, changing the ties of the railway through the summer and uh, made some good money and traveled a bit. And, and then when it came time to go back to school, I, I went back and gave me a little world for a couple of weeks and I thought, no, I missed the money. So I went back to early and uh, worked there till I was uh, 17. 
So you wandered past a recruitment center. Yes. And ended up joining the military. Yeah. <laughs> Me and my bunny were in North Bay, Ontario. And I went to just uh, walked down the street and I heard that there was a terrible recruit. So used to go, there's no life like in there. And I looked over, and there was this sandwich board of a soldier there, a sergeant, with his combat gear on, his helmet, his rifle, and boots shining, all that stuff. And when I walked in there, the sergeant behind the desk looks up, and, uh, like I was going to rob a place. That's that's the expression. <laughs> he was, he had long hair and a white tee jacket. Because it was then, the 70s. Had, yeah. <laughs> 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 and... Uh, I've told the story a few times, but he was very doubtful that I was sincere and, and I, you could tell he just wanted to get ready. And after I took an aptitude test, he told me I had two hours to write it and then it was done in half an hour. And then when I was done, he was using me to use to market and he came out, uh, his attitude was totally changed. He said, you could be anything you want and the Canadian forces set to pilot because you don't have the education. And so it was a pretty pivotal moment for me because no one had ever told me anything like that before. And, uh, but this time I made up my mind, I wanted to be in the infantry because they had the machine guns and the rocket launchers, grenades. It was right up my alley. I loved the bush and I loved to be outside. And he tried to dissuade me from it. And an officer from the PPCLI, who was the senior ranking officer at the recruiting center, took me in, you know, I said, a good choice. And the next thing you know, I swore to eat all the leads after I got my medical, but I was only 17, so I had to go back up to Northern Ontario. So my mom could sign me in. Yeah. So I was, it, it, that took a bit of convincing. She told me I was too gentle of a soul, that the army would be too hard for me. And then I told the alternative, right? <laughs> a roughneck kid on the rally might have a future, might not, but eventually she gave in and signed. So uh, that was the slap shot that got me in the game. <laughs> what event in your life has had the most profound impact on you? Uh, depending what part of your life, I suppose professionally it was in the military, joining the army. Mm -hmm. it, it was anybody that knew me before that, uh, would have never thought that that's where I would go. Personally, of course, getting married. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good and answer in case your wife is listening. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, getting married and, and uh, having our children, of course. Uh, the most yeah. And everything else flowed from there, right? Like, I've always been really observed of good leadership and we're all capable of doing that kind of stuff. I call them leadership bumps. A person says to you at a certain time, it's perfect, makes a suggestion and not realizing that it has a significant impact on the person that you said it to his life. Because when I was working on the railway, there's a big forward when we were working with him, he says, well, you're a good worker. He says, you should join the army. And that's all he said. We do that all the time, whether we realize or not. And I, and I just, I, I, that was probably the little leadership bump that bumped me to, to think, hey, I should join you. I've been beneficiary of a lot of those over my, over my time. And, and I hope I, I give a lot of them to other people too. When I first got to the army, or uh, well, I don't want to do too much army talking, but uh, I, at first basic training, it's hard. <laughs> I did not do well because I, I thought it would be right to the shooting and to the field and digging trenches and stuff. And it's still shining and polishing it and learning life skills that they teach everything from soul to polishing your boots and discipline. Now, in retrospect, I realized why it was so hard is because they gave you uh, so many tasks that you couldn't possibly do them. So you had to prioritize. And at first, I didn't have that maturity or ability to figure that out. I figured out once I went to my house that, that there's some stuff you can let slide, but the stuff that needs to be done needs to be done. But when I was in the battle school, I, I was, I had the fortune of having a section commander, a uh, guy, and I'm going to name him because hopefully he'll listen to this because he, he was another guy that made a lot of difference in my life, a guy named Mike Spella. And he was a mouse corporal of our section. As we go to the battle school, he would give me tasks. He'd say, Get the guys to do this or get the guys to do that or you're in charge of this. And, uh, and uh, so uh, the, the one day I asked him, he says, I said, how can we never see you sleep? I mean, never see you eat. He goes, I sleep when you guys both slept. I eat when I know y'all have eaten. 
then I asked him, I said, why do you keep giving me all these leadership roles? And he said, because in reality, we could go to war tomorrow. And so if I get killed in the first day, you're going to be the guy in charge. And through that conversation, I knew right then that that would be my philosophy for my professional life is train my replacement from day one. As soon as I got good at something, I looked for somebody that was coming up behind me. And I wanted them to be better than me. I talked to Mike years later. They never even thought what just did it as a matter of course, part of being a leader. But it was one of those leadership bumps that stuck with me for my whole life. And still to this day, when I meet somebody and if I could point them in the right direction as well. I love the leadership bump. That's so true how you have a conversation with one person and suddenly that just changes the trajectory. Exactly. So. And then lots of examples like that in my life. The underlying discipline through where you had to get up and you had to go up PT and you had to present yourself. You had to do your missions when you were in the field and all that stuff like that. That kind of solidified the foundation I take it over and solidified uh, the discipline. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was with the help of a lot of people, but that underlying discipline where there's no quitting. That's where that came from, especially in the art. There was no quitting. I right. had my mom telling me that when I called from basic training and asking if I could come home, she said, no, finish what you started. So you're thousands of miles away from home and forced to finish what you started. And so that bedrock of discipline was really solidified in take for me. That's a leadership bump from your mom too. I mean, well, it was yeah. like... Finish, finish what you start. It's classic tough love, but uh, yeah. yeah, she told me that after, like after I retired from the military and police that she uh, cried for weeks after, which she, that's what she needs to do, which wow. is, yeah. Because she's thinking about her kid out there far away from Oma. <laughs> what have I um, done? Yeah. 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 But uh, yeah, those huge things. You're a poster child for having lived a courageous life on a lot of different levels. What does living a courageous life mean to you? Integrity. You need to have it as your mm -hmm. bedrock and discipline. You got to love people. You're surrounded by how many million. <laughs> you need to love the people. You can't do it everybody. I'm not like Kumbaya. Uh, this is some awful people out there. But the majority, the vast majority of the people in life, counter in lives. I'd be having some rough patches here and there, but there's a basic human decency and you can, you can always draw that out. And if you do that and you're drawing out people's basic de decency, if, whether they're conscious of you doing it or not, I think you're helping them to live courageously, which makes you live courageously. That's, I don't know, it's a tough question, but the first answer is usually the most honest. I, I, so I believe if you could make people see and live courageously, then you're living courageously yourself. If you can mm. make people see their basic good nature, right? Then yeah, you're on the right path there. That's my opinion of it. Choosing to remain in patrol your entire career and giving up opportunities to progress to major crimes or some of these other areas of policing, you considered them, but ultimately, as you mentioned, was driven somewhat by being a bit of an adrenaline junkie, being at the tip of the spear in policing and being in, in those neighborhoods. But you brought such compassion to your work in those communities. As a First Nations person, we're often dealing with First Nations people in pretty shitty circumstances and dealing with their own demons. You were called names on all sides it's just a lot to try and wrap into one person's life. And through reading your books, I just saw, and what you said was just perfect in terms of just being who you are and showing someone compassion and, and encouraging their courage to allow you to be courageous. Did I get it right every time? No, not even close. Did I get it close to right? I just said not even close. But somehow, somewhere, it resonated with some people who are a lot of people. Even after I retired, guys that I used to deal with criminals, I would still walk out to me and still felt compelled to tell you their stories. And it's, and it's reciprocity. It's if you're kind to people in the, and even when they're in their worst circumstances at some level, somewhere it's going to come back to you. There's times when I was a, a hard ass with uh, some people, especially repeat offenders and drug tenders. But when the, if you want to call it the battle or the chase, or whatever, the interaction was done 
as long as you didn't gloat, you were okay. And you're there curse, but urge, but as long as you didn't rub it in, because you already accomplished what you were trying to accomplish, you stopped the behavior. And uh, some guys would never ever tell you that. Or I say guys all the time, because it's I'm, I, ex-army, everything's guys. <laughs> but, <laughs> They remember that. People remember that. And it's, we talk about that every day, actually, my wife and I, and, and, the, and the kids, I have to keep telling the kids the same thing all the time. It's easier uh, to smile at somebody and say thank you than it is to butt heads. Even if the first is rude to you, you just say, hey, thanks. I'm sorry you feel that way, but let's carry on. And and that basic, like said, reciprocity. I remember the first time I read that word, I went, ooh, I like that. <laughs> because it, it's true. It's human nature. If you're kind to somebody, even if you're doing hard business, it'll come back. Mm-hmm. It'll come mm-hmm. back to you. And uh, certainly me with like after, after I retired, cause I wasn't sure how things were going to go, of course. Cause I, I uh, was going 150 miles an hour for so long and all of a sudden, boom, I was done. And, uh, I wasn't sure how it would go. So many people, their whole identity is tied up in their, in their profession and, and they forget who they are as a person. And, and I was afraid that I, I, that's where I was. And so after retiring, all of a sudden I go, wow, I have mistreated it now for the first time since 1978, not private, not corporal, not sergeant, you know, you don't have a badge number, nothing, just mystery. And, and I'm wondering what I'd done in the preceding years if I might wreck them or not, right? If, or, if, or if I'd be able to let go of that old lifestyle. And I found that, like I said, all the foundation that you'd la- uh, lay down, actually, uh, was humbled by how things went. And uh, in placing, yeah, because it's so fast and, uh, and hard. You used to have a say that uh, 20 feet or 20 seconds, that someone will remember you when you leave. <laughs> and in some respects, that's true, but that's the nature of the business. Because they can't be telling you about homicide investigations or drug investigations and stuff like that. And they're still doing them. They're still working them. But the friends that I over the years from the community, from the law profession, the lawyers, defense lawyers, judges, other policemen, those friendships blossomed after I left. And mm. it was the biggest one, of course, was my wife. <laughs> when you're, when we were both working and it was, things were going on all the time and you forget how funny and how genuine a person, that's why I married in the first place, but you just forgot that, how amazingly funny she does right? no one she enjoyed time together yeah laying down that foundation i'm glad she stuck with me through all this because it was uh, there's certainly times when uh, a lot of people probably would have made it you faced death you've watched people die that was a, a big part of your life what would you do on your last day oh my gosh <laughs> well hopefully i won't know it's my last day you'll leave that a surprise <laughs> yeah, yeah. And all the smile and cheek hands as everybody are uh, the way I normally do. And, and if I know it's my last day, I guess I'll just make sure everybody I love has got what they need. And if, uh, if I st- I'm still capable of giving, it, giving them anything to take with them, I certainly will. Especially with my own, I shouldn't say children, my kids, but they're all adults now. But I, I just want them to not worry about stuff they shouldn't worry about. And if you really sit back and look at it, it was probably wasn't worth worrying about in the first place, right? There's some things that are important and a lot of stuff, especially with, I feel bad, bad for young people with uh, social media mm. and what a toxic place that is. And then you have little rock stars that are out there. I'll give you a plug here, but for uh, your podcast, that's a rock star from the guest because you're, it's a positive message and it's a positive thing. And, and. Like I said, if, uh, what I think is limited courageously, if, if you could help other people live courageously, if you're doing that, then you're, you're living courageously. That's the best way to put it. But if they could get away from all the toxic stuff that's out there and, and not everything is a crisis. And I, when I speak to seniors, when I did a lot of public speaking before COVID came, when I talk to seniors and I always say, how many people here think the world's falling apart? And mm-hmm. you'll see the heads nodding and the, Needing of the hands. And I said, it's not. I said, there's problems. He said, but if you could go back and look at a newspaper from 1900 and you have diseases, you have disasters, you have anarchists or terrorists, 
and you have war, you have conflict, and corrupt governments, and all this stuff. It's it's all there in the papers. But the difference between 1900 and 2022 or 2021 is in 1900, you had to wait till the paper got there. And, and it might be two weeks removed from the event, or even if you had a radio, they would just play it once and after that, it was music and serials. But nowadays, you could go in your kitchen at 80 years old, turn your TV on, and let the news cycle go through every 30 minutes. And mm-hmm. if that doesn't make you, you, especially as senior, as you feel more vulnerable as you get older, if that doesn't make you scared, I and mean, what else will? Because the world is just the world. <laughs> if you take a look to the left, you take a look to the right, you, you'll see it's not all that bad mm-hmm. for most of us, right? Unless you have a disease or something that you're battling. But for the majority of people, if you just stop for a second and look down your street or to your left and right, got everything you need don't have to like the government but at least we have one and then every couple of years we can get rid of it if we want to there's places in this world that, that type of freedom is just not available and uh, people die for wanting to vote i'd like people to keep it in perspective if they truly reflect on most of their lives are not too bad and if they can help people's lives that are bad give it a shot give it a shot yeah yeah. What's your legacy? I don't know what it's going to be. It's not done yet. Where's fiction books coming? Uh, your fiction is a thriller? Or is it a love story? Is it a bit of both? Uh, uh, it's, a bit of every, it's a bit of everything. Uh, it's not a cop book. When I got the editorial review, which was the first time it's previewed, her first line was, this is an excellent book. <laughs> So I like, because it's got everything, forest fires, game wardens, police, families, long courts, and it goes across a couple generations. So it was fun to write. Now the, now the neat picky stuff starts, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Looking forward to this. I just want, uh, tell you what, I, I, for as a legacy, I never used to think I went, when I retired, one of the young native consuls and assessing police signals, you're a trailblazer in this what do you mean? <laughs> you know, it's, so you're a trailblazer. I said, no, I says, you're all trailblazers right now. I don't know what a legacy, my legacy to be when I'm done. I'm not even sure I'm not done yet. That's why I guess I just hope that people, you know, say, ah, oh, that early. You don't have to like him, but he was true right a lot. <laughs> you know, he, he, or, he, he, or he made a difference or whatever the case is. Uh, I was talking to some of the consuls that are still working after retired and the, the one consul said she said that we were at a call and they there's i think three or four months this call and they all looked at each other what would he do <laughs> so i guess that's what would you see do? and they now i've got people doing papers on on my books everyone's really contacted I just want to ask you this my one of my daughter's friends is doing an essay on the first book i think she was texting my daughter. My daughter was really proud of that. And so I guess that's the you see it in the long run. Yeah, if, if I made people think differently and they can associate my name with it, then I guess that's a legacy. It never mm. really, like you said, really thought about it before. But oh, there's very many cons. We looked at each other and said, what would we really do? If you had five minutes to have a conversation with somebody living or dead, who would that be? I always said to Cumsey, hmm. God, because he was one of my heroes when I was going. I was never uh, General Brock. So I thought it was stupid to run up a hill and get shot. <laughs> we even saw it. <laughs> no. But uh, to, to Cumsey, because he had, <laughs> yeah, he, had, he had, from what I read it historically, it, he had a vision and uh, he just couldn't get all the cats herded together. Uh, but he has significant impact that kind of still resonates, especially in that Southern Ontario part where in Ohio and like where all the places he wrote, I thought he had a real significant impact. Now, and if I had a second one, I think just because he was so ballsy, he'd be Winston Churchill. Just, wow. That's a contrast. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> just because he was, Tecumseh didn't have a written record, but Churchill did. 
And mm-hmm. of the millions of words he wrote, there's so many quote unquote quotes and absolutely apply to life. The one I liked the most was, and I can never say this word, but it, is, it was be defied and defeat and magne- magnanimous. Magnanimous. Yes, that's the word. The w- that word. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And because that, that always made sense to me. It, it's if, if you had lost at something or whatever, you just, you try harder. And, it, and if you succeed at something that, comes at somebody else's cost. You should never do the football dance or the touchdown dance. Or, mm-hmm. I remember reading that when I was a kid and I just went, oh, that, I love that saying. Love that. Mm-hmm. Like, I could never say the word, though. I tried, tried selling it out many times, and then just gave up. <laughs> Don't I, do the I'm, football dance. I've, I've always said ambience as opposed to ambulance. So we all have the word that we've got. To, yeah. Uh, and just for the listeners, who is to, to come say because I have the listeners all over the world. Oh, it's Cupsy was a, a Shawnee chief uh, back in the, in the early 1800s in, well, North America was still getting himself sorted out. And uh, she was a great warrior and she tried to unite uh, the people of the Ohio Valley in Southern Ontario to stave off the American advance to their homelands. And he sided with the British ship. Unfortunately, I cost him his life during the War of 1812. But he was a man of vision. He, I think if he just survived, uh, I think he would have slowed down the American advance. Is there anything else that you'd like to share before we wrap up? Yes. Live your life courageously, as courageously as you can. And then I thank you for making me define what I thought living courageously is because I, I always had an idea of what I thought it was, but it, I never had to articulate it before. People listening to your podcast would uh, sit back for a minute after the end of an episode and just think, what's living courageously to me? And they'll, pro- they'll probably find that it's not too different from what we believe. If you live courageously, people will live courageously by your example. Mm-hmm. No, I certainly believe that. I believe the stories that you've shared and that others have shared, they'll find their own leadership bumps through those words. They'll find those moments of inspiration to tip them over into a moment of courage in their own life. And so that's why I'm doing what I'm doing for sure. Awesome. And look for them because they're there uh, all the time. And if you can give them, you know, right. Like you never, like said, you never know where it's going to go. Absolutely. That's a perfect way to end up. So thank you so much for this, Ernie. And uh, this has been really inspiring for me. I've loved reading your books. And uh, so all three of them is Indian Ernie, Perspectives on Policing and Leadership. There's more Indian Ernie, Insights from the Streets. And then most recently, The Unexpected Cop, Indian Ernie on a Life of Leadership. I really appreciate you speaking with me today. Thank you. I'll share in the show notes where you can buy Ernie's books and find out more about his story. I'd encourage you to support your local bookstore, such as McNally Robinson's if you live in the prairies, Epic Books if you live in Hamilton, and Ben McNally's or Type if you're in Toronto, to name a few. Ernie got his start as a writer from a small independent press, and it would be great to make sure we continue to support small businesses wherever you reside. And whether you're listening to this episode on Remembrance Day or not, I hope you'll take a moment to reflect on the sacrifices made by the men and women in uniform who keep our country and our streets safe. Miigwech, Ernie. Thank you for your service. And thank you for listening. Please follow or subscribe to this podcast. And if you feel someone else might benefit from listening to this episode, please share it. Leave a rating or review wherever you listen to your podcasts. Become a member of The Arena. Go to my website, thearena-podcast.com, and click on the support button. It's so greatly appreciated. I look forward to sharing my next guest's story. She helps her clients embrace the concept that dying is all a part of living. Until next time, my name is Linda McLaughlin in The Arena.